final conference speaker is Colonel Art Athens. Colonel Athens is the director of the U.S. Naval Academy's Vice Admiral James B. Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. His diverse background spanning the military, higher education, and the nonprofit sector. Colonel Athens has served as the Naval Academy's first distinguished military professor of leadership, commandant of the U U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, the executive director of OCF, the worldwide nonprofit organization helping military personnel integrate their faith and profession, a White House fellow under President Ronald Reagan, the special assistant to National. National Aeronautics and Space Administration Administrator following the Space Shuttle Challenger accident, and a U.S. Marine Corps officer who retired in July 2008 with over 30 years of combined serve, active duty and reserve service in significant command, staff, and instructional positions. In 2005, while fulfilling his other professional responsibilities, Colonel Athens volunteered to coach the Northern High School Boys Lacrosse Team and led the team to their first regional championship and a third place finish in the Maryland State Championships. The Washington Post selected him as the Coach of the Year. Colonel Athens hold a, holds a bachelor's degree in operations research from the Naval Academy, where he led in the lacrosse, served as brigade commander, and received the Alumni Award for overall academic, athletic, and leadership achievement. He also earned master's degrees from the Naval Post Graduate School, where he served first in his graduating class, and the Army School of Advanced Military Studies. He is married to the former Christina Root of Williamsburg, Virginia, and they have 10 children. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Athens. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, you did hear that correctly. That was 10. Um, and I'm sure you have a couple of questions going through your mind, so I'm going to answer those questions. Number one, yes, they're all mine. Number two, they're all with the same wife. Uh, number three is that they came one at a time, except for two of them that came as twins. Number four, we know how it happens. <laughs> uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning and especially have this chance to kind of wrap up the, uh, the conference. Uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of each person who's made the commitment to come to this conference and improve your leadership capability. Because I think leadership development is all about realizing that we have a debt we owe to those who we will eventually lead. Most of those you haven't met yet. Some haven't even been born yet. But we have a debt to them that we be the best possible leader we can be. And the only way that's going to happen is through development. A guy by the name of John Gardner was the Secretary of uh, Health, Education, and Welfare when HEW was a department under President Johnson, eventually became the founder of Common Cause and other nonprofit organizations, a, a tremendous individual. And he's the one that actually founded the White House Fellowship Program. And what Gardner used to say is, is that in the 1700s, we had a sparsely populated set of colonies. And those states produced people like Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, Monroe, Franklin, and the list goes on. So now we look and say we almost have 300 million people. Certainly we should have 30 times the number of those kinds of quality leaders. And the question is, do we? Well, whether we do or not, to have that kind of quality is going to take you all being serious about leadership development. Because we need leaders in the military, in the educational world, in the corporate world, in nonprofit, and education, everywhere we turn. We need leaders who have taken seriously the call that there's a debt owed that we have to all those we lead. Now, I want to close up the conference by just telling you a couple of stories and leaving you with three words that all begin with the same letter. I then know I can remember it, and you might be able to remember it as well, and that's how we're going to wrap it up. So let me start with the first story. Our second oldest son, Arthur, is uh, 25. He's a graduate of James Madison University in Virginia, not very far from here, about two hours west. He went there to play football. He played football for JMU, but he began to feel a service calling. And he looked around at the campus and found that there was an ROTC unit there that was an Army ROTC unit. So in his junior year, he joined up with that Army ROTC unit, eventually graduated and was commissioned in the Army in May 
of 2006. My son had five days off after graduation from college. He went to combat engineer school down in Missouri and then airborne school in Georgia and then got ready to go to his first place of assignment, which was Germany. Schweinfurt, Germany, about two hours east of Frankfurt. But he realized in communication with his commander that that unit was already deployed to Iraq. So he knew that he would go from the United States to Germany, drop his stuff, get his other material, and find his way to Iraq where he would command a platoon of about 40 soldiers right out of college. So he's getting ready to go to Baltimore Washington International Airport and uh, we had a brief conversation before he left. And he said, Dad, we've spoken a lot about leadership over the years. I'm about to go do the real thing. Could you kind of summarize it all before I go? <laughs> okay, that's a pretty tough assignment. Number one, leadership is very, very complex. And number two, I, I wanted to do this right because this was my son going into a pretty dangerous situation. So I'm racking my brain to think, how do I summarize leadership in about 15 minutes to my son who's about to go to Iraq? And all of a sudden it dawned on me, it was, it was a story that was told to me when I graduated from the Naval Academy, getting ready to command a platoon in the Marine Corps. A mentor of mine, a guy named Tom Hemingway, who was a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps, wanted to give me some advice before I stepped out into the Corps. So he told me his story of what happened to him when he took over his first unit as a brand new student out of the Citadel down in South Carolina, getting ready to take this platoon of about 40 Marines. What he heard about the person that was going to be his right-hand man his senior enlisted advisor, his platoon sergeant, his gunnery sergeant, is that that individual had landed at Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal because this incident takes place in the mid-50s. So the timeline's about right. This individual that my, at that time, young mentor friend was going to have to lead was someone who had landed at Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal in World War II. And that individual had actually become an officer and then was reverted back after the war. He then went to Korea, this same individual that my friend was going to have to lead across generations. And he went to Korea. And he landed at Incheon. And he was at the Chosin Reservoir when the Marines were up above the 38th parallel. And then hordes of Chinese came down to push the Marines back. And it was one of the toughest retrograde operations in history this individual had been there. And now my friend's wondering, so how am I supposed to lead this guy? This would be like you stepping out as a young lawyer and having the lead of a case as a civilian. And as you bring your team together, you find out one of your team members has argued before the Supreme Court on a number of occasions. And you're saying to my, yourself, how, how am I going to interact with that person? Or you go out into a place like McKinsey and Company as a consultant, one of the great consulting companies, and you're given your first assignment to help fix this business. And you find out that the person who's sitting with you is about 60 years old and helped IBM in their turnaround about 20 years ago. How do you lead that kind of person? So my friend Tom Hemingway was humble enough and smart enough to actually go up to that gunnery sergeant and say, Gunny, you know my background. I know your background. I'm just out of college. I don't know much of anything. But I've heard what you've done. And my question for you is, how am I supposed to lead you? How am I supposed to influence you? Why would, in the world, would you follow me? So the gunnery sergeant said, Lieutenant, let me tell you something. There's only three questions that I'm going to be asking about you and the other Marines are going to be asking about you as you attempt to lead us. The first question we're going to ask is, do you know your job or are you striving hard to learn it? Do you know your job or are you striving hard to learn it? That's the first question we're going to ask about you, Lieutenant. The second question we're going to ask is, will you make the hard but right decision? 
even if it costs you personally? Will you make the hard but right decision even if it costs you personally? And the third question we're going to ask about you is, do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? Do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? Those are the three questions we're going to ask. Do you know your job or are you striving hard to learn it? The second question we're going to ask is, will you make the hard but right decision, even if it costs you personally? And the third question we're going to ask is, do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? If you can answer those questions, Lieutenant, we're going to follow you. Tom then thought about those three questions. And in his mind, there were three C's that summarized those three questions. Competence, courage, and compassion. Competence, courage, and compassion. So Tom told me that story when I entered into the Marine Corps. That's the story that I then told my son, Arthur, and by the way, if we're concerned about labels, which I'm not, but if we were, all 10 of my children are millennials, including Arthur. And Arthur was going to step into a situation in Iraq where he was leading those kinds of people that had already been there in combat in the stressful situation. So Tom told me his story. I told Arthur that story. And Arthur went off to Iraq. He served in Ramadi where there was a great turnaround where the Sunni leaders came over to the Allied Coalition Forces side. Arthur was fortunate enough to be awarded the Bronze Star for action in combat. And when I got his first picture back from that area, there was a little index card on his cot, and it had those three C's, competence, courage, compassion. I'm not sure there's an easy way to summarize leadership, but I am convinced of this, that if our followers ask those three questions, no matter what kind of leadership situation we might find ourselves in. Do you know your job, or are you striving hard to learn it? Do you, are you ready to make the hard but right decision, even if it costs you personally? And do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? I've watched it for over 35 years, leading, developing leaders, studying leadership, talking to leaders. That's what followers ask themselves. I don't care if you're in a student leadership position, or you're the coach of a team, or whether you're the CEO of a corporation, or you're a team leader, or you're a platoon commander, or you're the CEO of a ship. It spans generations. It spans centuries. That's the questions that our followers are asking. So let's just take a quick look at those three. What about competence? Do I know my job? Well, I believe there's general competencies for leaders and very specific competencies. Let's take general first. These are the competencies that no matter what situation you go into, you've got to know how to do something about this. You need to know how to create a vision, a direction. Second of all, you need to know how to communicate. You need to know how to process information. You need to know how to make decisions. You need to know how to plan. You need to know how to counsel. So those are general competencies that almost wherever you show up, you're going to be applying those competencies. And we need to keep growing in our abilities in those general areas. But when you come to a specific job, there are things that are unique to that job that you've got to learn. And it's going to take effort. I remember Tom, my mentor, telling me, hey, the way you show your troops, your subordinates, your followers, that you're striving hard to learn is that you're energetic. You listen well. You ask questions. You try things that are new to you so that you learn and they see that you're interested in learning. When I was commandant on a midshipman at the US Merchant Marine Academy, which is kind of the dean of students and the head of leadership development, I had general competencies that I brought to that table. Those things like vision and communications and processing information and the rest. But I didn't know anything about the merchant marine. I didn't know about that fleet that many of those graduates were going to go to. So what did I do? I started reading about the merchant marine. I hooked up with an alumnus, a guy named Elliot Lombard. He would take me to dinner once a week. 
and he would take me out and teach me about the history of Kings Point. He actually were, he was on the merchant ships during the convoy operations in the Battle of the Atlantic. So we were sitting at dinner and he would take a paper napkin and he would start diagramming out how the convoys worked and where the submarines would come and experiences he had in stories. If we want to be competent, it takes hard work because we need to be developing the general competencies continuously and then we need to be specific to the role that we have, whether it's a lawyer or whether it's a consultant or whether it's a nonprofit executive or a military leader, it doesn't matter. We have to build those competencies. So that's competency. The second one is this courage. How do we have the courage to make the hard but right decision even when it costs us personally? I believe that comes down to one word and that one word is integrity. Integrity. The Latin integritus is where that word comes from. Integritus means whole, undivided. I was actually a math major here, but I still to this day, numbers are not my favorite thing. But I love integers because there's no fractions. There's no something after the decimal point to confuse it. It's all pure, whole, complete. That's what integrity is about. I thought it was a very good question that was asked on Monday, if I remember, that someone asked about Facebook accounts. You know, what about things we're doing now that might come back to haunt us years later? I believe that integrity encompasses both our personal and professional lives. I think leaders are in trouble where they separate out what they're doing on the personal side from what they're doing on the professional side. We must be true and honest and respectful and courteous, all those things both personally as well as professionally. There's got to be a consistency. The leaders that I have struggled with over the years are those who are not consistent. They're not consistent in their actions, what they do on their own time, and then all of a sudden they put on the face that I'm the great leader. Can't buy that. Can't buy, and neither will your followers buy that either. They may put up with it, but it'll never excite them. It'll never motivate them to do things above and beyond. You know, on uh, Monday as well, there was a name that was mentioned by the CEO, President and COO of BAE Systems, Mr. Havenstein. He said the person that had the most influence in his life was a guy named Tom Drowdy. Let me tell you a story about Tom Drowdy when it comes to the courage to make the hard but right decision even when it costs you personally. Tom Drowdy, graduate of the Naval Academy. He's in Vietnam in 1966. He's a company commander, Charlie Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. And he has the responsibility as a company commander to secure or gain a hold of a hamlet being held by North Vietnamese regulars. They battle all day. At one point, they are actually in hand-to-hand -hand combat and then finally, the South, Viet the South Vietnamese with, at that time, Captain Drowdy's company are able to push the North Vietnamese just outside the hamlet. And in the meantime, he brings his forces back and sets up a perimeter to protect them for the evening. But then Tom Drowdy hears that one of his corporals, Corporal Miller, a young, young man, was dead out in that hamlet. Captain Drowdy took two of his Marines and the three of them made their way through enemy fire to pick up this corporal and bring him back even though he was already dead so that he could have a proper burial. The next day, Tom Drowdy's boss, a battalion commander, shows up at this area and he looks at Captain Drowdy who has blood all over his flak jacket and he says, Drowdy, what have you been doing? So Drowdy said, well, last night, sir, we heard about one of our Marines that we needed to recover out in the hamlet, so I went out with two of my guys. I picked the corporal up and brought him back to our friendly territory. The battalion commander just started yelling at him. I don't ever want to see one of my company commanders do that. Don't you understand how important you are? You can't be doing something like that. I want you to tell me right now that you will not do that again if you're faced with the same situation. Captain Drowdy, as he'll explain the story, then says to himself, wow, I can't do that. 
but I bet if I tell the battalion commander that I won't ever do that again, I might lose my job. So what do you do? So Tom Drowdy looked at the battalion commander and said, Sir, I cannot promise you that. If I had a wounded or dead Marine, I would bring him back the same way I did yesterday. The battalion commander on the spot said, Captain Drowdy, you are relieved. You are fired. Just as this was happening, a helicopter came over, and the helicopter landed, and the next higher boss, the division commander, came walking right towards Captain Drowdy and the battalion commander talking to each other. Drowdy had already been fired. The division commander walked into the group and he said, where's that uh, Captain Tom Drowdy that I've heard about? Well, there he was. And so Drowdy's thinking to himself, wow, a bad day just got worse because now the division commander, the next higher guy, has now showed up as well. And the division commander says, Drowdy, I want to shake your hand. I heard about what you did yesterday. That is fantastic. And then he turned to the battalion commander. He said, son, you're lucky that you have this kind of officer working for you. Well, of course, the old battalion commander was a little shook by that statement. He didn't say much of anything, and neither did Captain Drowdy. The division commander walked away. The battalion commander said to Drowdy, well, I, I guess you have your job back. <laughs> he would then be awarded the Silver Star, one of the highest decorations that we have in the military for his actions that day. Tom Drowdy would eventually become a general officer. He's a fantastic individual. He shows what it means to make the hard but right decision, even when it costs you personally. And we have not had enough people in our country as a whole being willing to do that in all the different aspects of life to make sure we're on the right course. But your followers are going to be asking that about you. Are you going to make the hard but right decision even when it costs you personally? But it's not just the military that happens. 1982, the Tylenol crisis. If any of you are leadership or management majors, you, you probably have read about it. Seven people die from cyanide poisoning taking Tylenol tablets in Chicago. James Burke is the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. Against the recommendation of most of his subordinates, he says, we need to stand for what is right, so we are going to pull off every Tylenol over every place in America, every variety. And everyone said, it will sink the company. And he said, if it does, it will still be the right thing to do. So they pulled every Tylenol off at the cost of millions and millions of dollars. And they pulled them off until they could find these tamper-proof things, which still drive me nuts. You know, you can't open these things anymore, but that's all because of Johnson & Johnson and Tylenol. Three ways to ensure that people would feel safe again. And of course, Johnson & Johnson rebounded tremendously, even with that loss, because there was a leader who was willing to make the hard but right decision, even if it cost him personally. So competence, courage, and the last one is compassion. Do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? In 1984, there was a young lady who had a hit song, won a Grammy Award for it, number one Billboard hit. The name of the song was, What's Love Got to Do With It? Remember that one? You know who the artist is? Tina Turner. I can actually do a Tina Turner imitation, but I'm not going to do that this morning. <laughs> but if you, if, you, if you listen to the chorus of that song, what's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Okay, so for a lot of people, if you hold up the word leadership and the word love and you bring them together, people go, What's love got to do with it? But your people are praying and hoping that you care about them deeply. And yes, even thinking about it in terms of the word love. Not romantic love, sacrificial love. That's what they're hoping of you. Sacrificial love that will be demonstrated towards them. Another Marine story, General John Lejeune was the CEO of the Marine Corps, the head of the Marine Corps, four-star general. Actually, he wasn't four-star at that time, but now they're four stars. General Lejeune had been a division commander in World War I, commanding Army and Marine Corps forces. November of 1918, World War I ends. General John Lejeune is walking through his field hospital the day after the war ends, and he sees a wounded Marine. 
who had had a leg amputated. So out of concern for that Marine, he walks up to the Marine and he says, Marine, what, uh, what happened to you? Marine says, uh, sir, I, uh, I was part of a battalion and we had to secure a bridge over the Meuse River, which we did yesterday. And there was artillery fire and small arms went into my leg and they felt to save my life, they had to take it off below the knee. He said, that happened yesterday. Yes, sir, it did. He said, what induced you to go across that bridge knowing what you knew? The Marine looked at General Lejeune with some tears in his eyes and he said, sir, uh, Captain Dunbeck, our battalion commander, called us together on the friendly side of the river before we got ready to go over. And we all knew that the war was just about to end. But what Captain Dunbeck said to us was this. I've been given a mission to take that bridge and I'm going across that bridge and I expect you to go with me. And then the sergeant said, General Lejeune, we certainly weren't going to let the captain go across that bridge by himself. We loved him too much for that. When Lejeune wrote about that story in a book he wrote, he said this, I've always felt that the incident I have just narrated gives one a better understanding of the meaning and practice of leadership than do all the books that have been written and all the speeches that have been made on the subject. Yes, affection and love and care for our people is absolutely essential. I don't care what the generation is. I don't care what the environment is. I don't care how many electric electronic devices we have, it does not matter. Our people want to know that we care about them deeply. And when they know that, they're going to do some extraordinary things that they would never have done without having that care and concern. So the first question that your followers are going to ask you is, do you know your job or are you striving hard to learn it? Competence. They're going to ask, do you know, are you going to make the hard but right decision even if it costs you personally? Courage. And then they're going to ask, do you care as much about me as you care about yourself? And that's compassion. Let me put it into context. I'm a baby boomer, I guess. I took over a head coaching job at a high school down where I live, down in Southern Maryland back in 2005. I had two young sons on the team, a senior and a sophomore. Two weeks before the season started, the head coach took a job at another state and left two weeks before the season's about to begin. An assistant coach quits outright, and a third assistant actually has some kind of a health problem. So they have no coaches as the season's about to begin. Lacrosse is a pretty big deal here in Maryland. A high school does not want to go without a team. So the principal and the athletic director approach me and they say, we know some of your background. Would you be willing to coach this high school team? I said, there's no way. I said, I got too much going on. I went home, told my wife, Misty, hey, they wanted me to coach this lacrosse team, but uh, you know, obviously I told them no. She gave me one of those looks that communicated a lot in just her eyes. <laughs> and then she spoke just to reinforce it. And she said, <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to do this? These are our sons who could have you as their coach. This is a sport you love. This is an opportunity to make a difference in some young people's lives. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I went back and told the principal athletic director, sure, I'll take, I'll take the team. So when I think about competence, courage, and compassion working across generations and tying in a lot of things that have been said this last couple of days, I, I do think about that high school lacrosse team. Because I had to come in and I had to answer the question for them, do you know your job or are you striving hard to learn it? So I had to show general competency. So one of the general competencies I showed was that I know how to put a vision together. So this was a losing team, had been a losing team for as long as the program existed. I brought that team the very first day into the gymnasium. And up in the gymnasium, just like in many high schools, there are banners. And I said, gentlemen, I want you to look up at the banners. 
and I want you to tell me what's missing. Of course, they sort of got the message, well, coach, uh, there's no lacrosse up there. You're right. And we are going to put a banner in this gym this year. And let me tell you something else, guys. We are going to act and work like champions on and off the field. We are going to be known as champions. Okay, so that's a vision. That's a general competency is to help an organization figure out where to go. General, uh, Governor O'Malley talked about that the other night. Important, very important. But then I had to have specific competency. And I was a goalie. And I know a lot about defense, but I don't know a lot about offense. But I'm the head coach, and I don't have any assistants. It's me. So that means my specific competency is going to have to figure out how to run an offense for a high school team competing against some of the best high schools in the nation. So how do you do that? You study. I got books. I got tapes. I went and talked to Coach Mead, the head lacrosse coach here. I study. And sometimes it costs me, like sleep and getting to do some things I'd like to do. But that's what leadership is about. Leadership is always about sacrifice. So if I was to run this team, I was going to have to have the general competencies and the specific competencies. OK, the next question all those guys were wondering is, OK, well, is he going to make the hard but right decision, even if it costs him personally? Because I had some very specific standards. So I take my face-off, guys. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with lacrosse, but face-off is what happens in the middle of the field to start a game after every goal. And what it does is it gives you potentially possession of the ball. So face-offs are very, very important. Two guys get next to each other with their sticks facing each other. The ball's placed in the middle, and they fight for the ball. I found a guy who is a really good face-off specialist. So I brought him in to talk to my face-off guys, because I knew if we were going to win, we had to get face-offs. So he instructs them great about face-offs until his last couple of comments, which were, hey, uh, let me just tell you this. Face-offs are mainly about cheating. Okay, If you can cheat better than the other face-off guy, you're going to win. So here's a couple of techniques of how you can cheat. So I'm listening to this, and he shows the players and the players come back after this seminar, and they're all excited. Hey, coach, we know how to cheat now better than the, than the other face-off guys. And I said, guess what? We're not going to cheat on the face-off. We are going to win the face-off because you're better, faster, quicker, and you want it more. Now, it would have been much, much easier to sort of turn a blind eye and say, hey, everybody does it. That's not a good enough reason. So I had to risk losing some face-offs to convince my guys that the right way to do it was the legal way, because in the long run, that's always best. Probably cost me a couple of face-offs during the season. But what I got were three young men who understood that integrity was more important than winning. Now, the third question that they were all going to be asking were, uh, okay, so do you care about me as much as you care about yourself? So I, I've heard a lot over the last couple of days about work-life balance. I've heard about transparency. I've heard about this whole concept as far as network leadership. And when I look back on it, I realized a lot of those things happened on that team. Number one is my practices were exactly two hours. They had other things to do. I would have rather had three hours because we needed it. But I realize that's part of leadership is always bringing balance to your people. So they could count on we would start our practice at 3.30 and we would end at 5.30 and they'd be on their way. So that to me is showing, yeah, I care about you. I'm thinking about your welfare. The second thing is, is I pick three captains. And I would bring my captains in every night after practice. And I'd say, well, what do you think? How did it go? What would you have done different if you were the coach? How do you think I'm doing? Am I communicating all, all right? Are we doing the right kind of drills? These captains didn't know what to do. Like, never anybody had ever asked them that. Why did I ask them? Because I cared. I knew that there was good feedback there. So it was a demonstration of caring. 
But my favorite part of caring was one of my players when as the season began, I interviewed every single one of the seniors. And I brought them in one at a time because I didn't know them. I had been in the area one year before, but had watched all across from the stands. And so I bring them in one at a time, asking them what their goals were, where they want to go to college, you know, what do you think about lacrosse, what do you think your strengths, and we, all those kinds of things. So this young man comes in, and he's dressed very, very differently than I'm dressed right now, and most of you are dressed. He had really baggy shorts on. He had a T-shirt that had some derogatory statement on it. I don't really remember what it was. He had earrings all the way up his ears, across his eyebrow, you know, and I can, I can, that's fine. All that stuff, that's, that's surface things. Tattoo, all the surface. But I'm looking at him going, wow, he and I are like really different. So then he starts the conversation by going, hey coach, you remember me from last year? Well, I, I didn't coach last year. No, I know that, but we had that brawl with uh, Patuxent High School, you know, and I was pounding on this one guy, and you came out of the stands and kind of pulled me off. <laughs> I do remember you. Okay? <laughs> and I try to help people with interviews sometimes. That's not normally how I suggest you start an inter interview process to make a good impression with the boss. But nevertheless, that's how this guy was. So as he walks out, I realize, wow, we're really different. But the other thing is, I'm going to make a commitment to love that person because he's, he's one of mine. He's on my team, and I've got to love him. So the second day after our uh, practice, the principal of school comes up to me, and he says, hey, I just want you to know, you know, I know you guys never win. That, that's not a big deal to me. Uh, but what is a big deal to me is your lacrosse guys always get in trouble, so I hope you'll kind of turn that around. And I'm thinking to myself, look, look you're, you're lucky you have a coach, and now you want me to solve all your disciplinary problems. But anyway, he goes on and says, hey, there's this one guy, and he mentions this same guy who I interviewed the day before. He says, the guy's a bum. Get rid of him, quick. He'll be a cancer on your team. I said, oh, okay, okay I'll, you know, we'll see how that goes. He says, you watch. He won't even show up for practice sometimes. I said, well, I have pretty strict standards on showing up for practice, so we'll see how that works. And uh, one day, he doesn't show up for practice. So now I'm thinking in the back of my mind, wow, maybe the principal was right. I walk up from the practice field, and there, right by the locker room, is this young man standing there. So I come up to him and I say, hey, you okay? And he says, coach, could I talk to you privately? So I go off with him, and he says, coach, uh, last night I was driving home from practice, and, and I swear to you there were no drugs, no alcohol, which turned out to be true. But I was going very, very fast. And I was changing my CD player as, as I was going through a light. And I looked up and I realized I was right in the middle of a red light going right through it. I hit another car really hard. And, um, and I killed the driver in the other car. And coach, I, I don't know what to do. So I realized at that moment in my life that I already made the commitment to love this guy, and I knew he was going to be through a lot of tough times, but I also realized that he was going to know by the time it was all over that I cared as much about him as I cared about myself, and we were going to walk through this thing together. And he eventually, um, a couple of weeks later, actually broke his collarbone in one of our games, and he still came to practice, every practice. And then we got into the state playoffs, and we're in the state semifinals, and he's finally gotten cleared to play. And he wasn't even a very good player. Uh, and I looked down the sidelines, and I realized I got to get him in this game. I got to get him in this game, not that I need him, but he needs this. And even when we meet each other today, down in Southern Maryland every once in a while, he remembers that game. Probably the most important thing from his standpoint that he's ever done in his life. Because he was one of the followers that was asking the question, so does this guy who's leading me really care as much about me as he cares about himself? Competence, courage, compassion, it shows up in all kinds of forms. Organizations, corporations, nonprofits, educational, military, sports, but here's the kicker at the end that ties this conference together. The question that we always have to ask ourselves coming out of this kind of experience, so what? 
So what of all the stuff I've heard over the last three days? So what about three C's? So what about the governor talking about vision, assessment, and changing direction? What's the so what? Well, here's part of the so what. Part of the so what is you, if you're going to go into the area of leading others, you're going to be leading in four directions. You're going to be leading up and you're going to be leading your boss. You're going to be leading down to those who are looking up to you. You'll be leading horizontally to your peers. And you'll also be leading inwardly, leading yourself. Those first three, those three questions are the questions when you begin to think about the relationships up and down and to the sides. Competence, courage, compassion, always at the centerpiece. The inside part is the part of development, of you becoming better than you are today. And it always takes both action, trying things, but it also takes reflection. It takes stepping back every once in a while and saying, what did this mean that I just did? It means stepping back sometimes and saying, what is really important in life? We have 10 children, but one of those young guys died at a pretty young age, our ninth child, Daniel. It made me step back and say, what is really important in life? And we all need to have those times, whether they're forced upon us or not, to step back and say, what's really important? How am I leading? How am I interacting with other people? What's, what's my priorities? That's my one concern about the rush of technology. It tends to prevent us sometimes from taking that time to step back and look inwardly. But while we're looking inwardly, those three C's remain true. As a matter of fact, it goes back even further than this quote, but this quote is from 480 BC. If you've seen the movie 300 about the Spartans in the gap there at the Battle of Thermopylae, that's not really the true story. That's a Hollywood version of it. There's a book called Gates of Fire, which is a historical novel that the movie was sort of loosely based on. But then there's real history of what happened there. But in the Gates of Fire, I think they have a pretty accurate description of a slave from the Spartans who was captured by the Persians. And up on a hill, King Xerxes is looking down, and he sees this Spartan formation. And he's heard about this King Leonidas who has brought this group to the past. 300 against thousands and thousands. So out of curiosity, he asked the slave, since the captured slave was from the Spartan camp, what is this all about? And this is what the slave says. I will tell His Majesty King Xerxes what a king is. A king does not abide within his tent while his men bleed and die upon the field. A king does not dine while his men go hungry nor sleep when they stand at watch upon the wall. A king does not command his men's loyalty through fear nor purchase it with gold. He earns their love by the sweat of his own back and the pains he endures for their sake. That which comprises the harshest burden, a king lifts first and sets down last. A king does not require service of those he leads, but provides it to them. He serves them, not they him. Competence, courage, compassion. That's how you end up leading upward downward and laterally. But the question still is, what about the leadership within? As you come out of this conference, realize this. Most people who come out of conferences come out excited and energetic and do nothing. They change nothing. They improve nothing. 
My challenge to you is to be one of those who does change and then is able to make a difference. So my challenge to you is within the next 24 hours, sit down and think about what you've experienced here and pick one thing, just one thing, that you want to focus on, that you want to change in your life to just get a little bit better because there may be hundreds and thousands of people that are counting on you because someday you will be their leader and they are counting on you to take that time to reflect, to lead inwardly so that you will be better than you are today. And if you come away from the conference with that one item and really do something about it, then you'll be ready to go to the next step of development where you take one more thing and get a little better at that. And eventually, those followers of yours will look at you and say, does this person know their job? Yes, they do. Will this person make the hard but right decision, even if it costs them personally? Yes, they will. And does this person care as much about me as they care about themselves? Yes, this person does, and therefore, they are worthy to be followed. Because ultimately, as it has been said a number of times during this conference, it is about trust. And I don't care the generation, I don't care the ethnicity, the race, the religion, the gender. Those things hold true. And for us leaders, we need to pay attention. I thank you for your time and attention this morning. And I'm, I, I'm not sure who to look at. Do we have a couple minutes that I could open it up for questions before you got to go on buses and things like that? Sure. Let, let me take just a few. I know many of you are thinking about, I wonder you know, if my flight's getting off, is the bus going to make it to wherever you're going to? But if you have a question about anything that I've said or what were you thinking when you had that many children, you know, I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to answer that. Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question had to do with how do you balance sometimes doing leadership at, you know, where you're actually leading people as compared to these other experiences which broaden you and make you a better leader down the road. Does that capture the question? Uh, first of all, there's one great thing about leadership, but it's also frustrating. There is no checklist. You remember that first day, I think it was one of the many PowerPoint slides that was up there. It said that maybe your generation is more checklist oriented. I don't find that in my own children, but I, I don't know. May, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. What I find though is, is it's a lot more based on your personality than your generation, how much you're interested in a checklist. But there's many people out there who want to be leaders who also, and I'm not saying you want a checklist, I'm just making a point. There's no easy answer for that one because that's what leaders do all the time is balance things and make tough decisions. I think you're the best one who can tell, is this a time where I need to broaden myself out? In other words, I've gained a lot from this group. I can turn it over to someone else because that's what leaders have to do too is prepare the next person to do that. And I feel comfortable with that. And then this broadening experience is what I need at this point in time. This also is where mentorship comes in, where people who, who know you, who are further along the journey, can talk to you about that. We all need mentors. We all need people we can sit down and ask those kinds of questions who know us and say, look, you know, I've watched you. you you've got a lot of practical experience, but, but here's an opportunity to see how something works at a higher level. Why don't you, why don't you go do that? That was a hard decision for me when I applied for the White House Fellowship Program. It took me out of the mainstream leadership of the Marine Corps for the moment, but I thought the experience I would gain at that level was something that would be beneficial to me at that point in time. But I had a lot of people around me who helped give me advice 
to guide me in that, in that kind of area. So we need to keep bouncing back between general competencies and specific competencies to make sure we can answer that question of do you know your job down the road. Another question. Go ahead. Sir, I'm, I'm, my name is Robert Best. I'm from San Diego State University. Um, Welcome. Regarding your, uh, your core values of competence, courage, and compassion, do you believe uh, leaders are born or made? Okay. Uh, the question is, are leaders born or made? I found every leader I've ever worked for has been born, so I've, I've sort of figured that one, <laughs> sort of figured that one out. Just kidding. Okay, here, here's, I, I've thought about this for about 35 years, probably even more, you know, are leaders born or made? Here, here's how I look at it. First of all, if I didn't believe they could be made, I probably wouldn't be here and I probably wouldn't be involved in the business I, I am right now. But I look at it as kind of a scale here from zero to 10, all right? 10 is like that leader, you know, sort of the George Washington, Abraham Lincoln category, that's a 10. And I don't think even they were 10. I don't think anybody gets to 10, but they're probably pretty close. And then there's a zero, and there's a one. And I think to be involved in leadership, you have to break that one barrier. Here's the problem. I don't know what's between zero and one. I don't know what it is that is the prerequisite to at least have a fighting chance to be developed. I know one piece of it is, is, is appreciating and understanding people. If you don't care about people, leadership is the wrong field for you. But, I, you know, I've had people, I, I've asked people, so what, what do you think is between the zero and the one? And they'll say, like, physical energy. And then I'll give them a counterexample of someone who was a great, great leader who was sick or what, and they still were leading. And then they might say intelligence. And I can point out leaders who, if you look at the IQs, you know, but there's something between zero and one. Now, our challenge and your challenge is to keep moving up the scale. So if you're a two, your aim should be a, to be a four or a five. If you're a four, become a six. If you're a seven, become an eight. I think it gets tougher at the top to get that kind of next piece. So I think there is an innate piece to it, but then leaders can certainly be developed. And we continue to be developed through a, a wide variety of techniques, experience, mentorship, self-knowledge, academic study, all these kinds of things add in. So I do believe leaders still can be made, but I've worked with some that it just, they're better off in a, you know, doing something else rather than trying to influence people, which is what leaders have to do. I'll probably take one more question and then I, I think I need to turn it over to the Naval Academy group. In the back. Okay, sounds like a checklist question, but I'll, I'll tackle it anyway. I'm kidding. Okay, the question is, is you got people who work for you and you got tasks that have to be done and the question is which ones do you delegate and which ones do you hold on to yourself? Um, I, I'm gonna make some general comments and that is be very interested in delegating work to people. Number one, because you need to take that burden off of yourself so you can think about the right kinds of things. And number two, you also need to develop your subordinates. They need the opportunity to do things. The challenge with delegation is, is releasing a task to someone who's going to do it a little bit differently than you. And you cannot react by thinking to yourself, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, so it must not be right. We've got to redo it. No, you don't. As long as the task, the mission has been completed, it's okay. I think a broader question is for leaders, in any kind of leadership position you have, you have to decide what are the five to seven most important things that I have to do in this particular position. And, and I, I talk about, I, I, talk, I like to talk a lot about humility as well, so I, I'm a little conscious of saying this because it almost sounds like, oh, well, I, I just want to drop a name here. But I met with the Vice Chief Naval Operations, Admiral Walsh, yesterday, a four-star admiral. It was very interesting to talk to him about this very thing, actually, of delegation. He has a pie chart where he has decided the most important things he does as the second highest ranking guy in the Navy, 
and then he evaluates on a frequent basis how well he's meeting those percentages, whether it's interacting with Congress, interacting with other admirals, developing his subordinates, he has all these categories. And the thing is, you've got to decide what are the most important things you have to do as a leader, and many of those things you are going to do yourself. But if you start finding yourself overwhelmed and overburdened, you're probably not passing things down enough. And it hurts you, it hurts those who are following you because they don't get the opportunity, and then the last part is it, help, it, it actually hurts the overall organization as well. So figure out the main thing that you've got to do and then, and then pass on as much as possible to other people and then be willing to accept their results that are different than yours as far as how they did it as long as they met your intent of what you wanted to have accomplished. Last word is thank you for being interested in leadership. We need leaders just like John Gardner said many years ago. Have a safe travel home. God bless you. Thank you.